we're going to start right one minute late is all. Hey, Nancy. So, Fett and I are both rookies at this, but I am on the steering committee name now. My name is Karen Long, and I'm gonna, we're going to trade off with facilitating the meetings. And thank you for coming. This was sort of a last-ditch effort that we really want to hear from our counselors. So we decided it was really worth having an August meeting. And as it was, we had people knocking at the door. So we actually have three presentations. Now I, yeah, we have three presentations, two quick ones, and then the superintendent is coming. So there's a lot of interest and a lot of action going on right now. So I think that's great. So we'll start with Speak Out. Let's start here with Richard. I was saying tonight I wish I had his humor to like get us through this, but I'll try. So Richard Hilliard was our devoted steering committee person for many years, but he can still announce himself. Oh. oh, and do I give you this, I suppose? Here's a oh, cordless yes. too. Oh, okay. You can keep your mic. Hello, my name is Adam Roof. I live on Pearl Street, and I am the city councilor representing Ward 8. Good evening. I'm Sharon Busher. I live on East Avenue, and I'm the Ward 1 city councilor. Hi, I'm Jack Hansen. I live on Pearl Street. I'm the East District city councilor. Yeah, hi, Tony Reddington. I live in Ward 2. I'm uh, visiting as a steering committee member of Ward uh, 2 and 3, and uh, live on uh, the what will be the greatest street in Burlington, uh, North and South Winooski Avenues. Sophie Quest, Quest, J Street. Jean Hopkins, East Ave, co-housing. Hi, I'm Keith Pillsbury. I live on University Terrace. I'm the Ward 8 School Commissioner. Hannah Carpino, CEDAW. Uh, Joe Spidell, I work with UVM and I live in Ward 3. I'm Liv Pena, I live in Ward 1, and I am a member of the steering committee. I'm Linda Risby, and all Ward 8, and also a member of the steering committee. Hi, I'm Carol Livingston, I live in Ward 1, also a member of the steering committee. Hi, I'm Cindy Cook, I li live on East Avenue, and I'm also on the steering committee. We stick together, so in case you guys can. <laughs> And I'm Jonathan Chapel Sokol. I'm in Ward 1, and I'm also on the steering committee. And if I can um, ask everybody, this microphone is for Channel 17, so it doesn't amplify. So talk into it, but talk loudly for everybody in the room to hear. Thank you. Just to remind you, we are all volunteers on the steering committee. Thank you. So don't beat us up if we Nancy Kirby, Ward 1. Thank you. Jason Suffel, Colchester Ave, and Old East End Neighbors. Brian Sewell, Loomis Street, Ward 1. Caitlin Halpert, Loomis Street, Ward 1. Rebecca Thompson, I live in Ward 2, and I'm here to talk about a program. Michael Long, Henry Street, Ward 1. Great, thanks. So we have 10 minutes now to have speak out, which is for you to make any announcements that you'd like. And then we will also have an extended time with our city councilors to ask them questions. So tonight we're hoping to have a lot of uh, back and forth with people, but does anyone have any speak out time? Anything, any announcements? How about the bright green shirt? I like that. Here, I'll give you your announcement. Okay, um, so with the Old East End neighbors and uh, several other people, we're throwing a party at Schmanska Park on Friday, September 13th from 4 to 7, and it's a get-to-know-people-in-your-neighborhood party. Uh, there was kind of one last October uh, based on Schmanska doing uh, some new work on the park and kind of having an opening of that. Uh, so there's uh, Nash Place neighbors, uh, UVM Student Life, uh, Campus Kitchen, uh, the old East End neighbors uh, all kind of thought that this would be uh, a nice thing to do. And so we're going to have uh, Campus Kitchen's going to throw in some food. Uh, UVM's going to bring some games, some food, and some tents. Uh, there's a new staircase there uh, from Vermont Youth Conservation Corps, so they'll be there. And then uh, 
Burlington Parks and Rec will also be there to have the barn open so that you can go in and view it. Uh, it's not technically for use, um, but so you can view it and it's in the process of trying to be reopened. Um, we'll have more details coming out, but if anyone else wants to help uh, participate with that, we have a couple people that are kind of working to drive all of that, but the, the main details are coming out soon. And so we hope everyone comes out uh, from the neighborhood, the new students, all the people that live here, uh, the new people at Bayberry, uh, and come down and just enjoy the, the new park and get to know your neighbors for a good time. All right, thanks. Uh, the date is Friday, September 13th from 4 to 7 p.m. And it'll be at Schmanska Park. And uh, you know, it was welcome for anyone to come down and uh, get to know your neighbors. Thanks. So you want to hand the microphone to Tony, please? He's close. There you go. Speak. Please sure. Speak uh, yeah, I just want to speak briefly. Again, Tony Reddick, as again, I'm on the Ward 2-3 uh, uh, Steering Committee, and uh, we took August off. Uh, uh, and I hope that when we start September, uh, we meet the day after your regular meeting, uh, the second Thursday. Ours is the second Thursday of the month. We have a community dinner that starts at 5.30 that's free. Uh, it's an incredible dinner. And then, of course, even better is our, uh, like, almost as good as yours here at uh, uh, Karen, uh, our NP. PA23. I just wanted to stop by briefly to talk about uh, the Pine Street Coalition. We haven't been back for a while. Uh, we, I think that uh, uh, there's also a new, we, we obviously are seeking a new environmental impact statement process, a new, basically start a new design from scratch. And uh, we have now moved to the U.S. District Court and we're hopeful that we will be successful there and we will have a community driven uh, design process of a, a street that people can love here in the city. Uh, the last effort, the last public hearing uh, was held in 2006, a few years ago. Uh, there's a, a nice picture in uh, today's seven days that talks about the pit and we sort of look at the uh, uh, the current design for the parkway is very much the big hole in the south end. And uh, we right now have one injury per week uh, for either pedestrian or bicyclist in the city. We have two car occupant injuries. Safety is important. And all the safety aspects of the, of the parkway uh, were, were never discussed and none of the current best practices are used. Um, an example would be that, for example, you would expect to find a sidewalk, spend $47 million, you'd expect to find a sidewalk. No sidewalks in the uh, Pines in the uh, parkway. You would expect to find uh, a the uh, the other piece that's really bad is the disconnection of the south end from uh, Hannaford's. If you've been down there at all now, that's already closed off for construction. Uh, make a long story short, there uh, there are a few flyers on the uh, table. Uh, you could help by uh, signing our petition online, and if you have questions, uh, just give us uh, just contact us and check out our website. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Uh, Jason forgot to say he's got more t-shirts. Safe Colchester Avenue for all. We're all people and we all need to be safe and we are having bike lanes up and down all of the hill of Col Colchester. He's awesome. got, he's got more t-shirts. Great, Nancy. Could you hand that to Nancy please? Thank you. Speaking of safe Colchester Avenue, I'm really happy it's paved. The lane is incorrect, and in the past two weeks, seven vehicles, parked cars have been hit, and two accidents. One was a drunk driver coming too fast, and another one avoided hitting an, a rabbit and hit two parked cars. And um, I almost got hit pulling into my driveway with a car trying to pull around where the bus stop is. So yeah, it's a nice smooth pavement, but it's become a speedway. And I'm about ready to throw rotten eggs at cars going too fast. So something's gotta be done. Thank you, Nancy. Yep. Keith? Oh, you wanna? Okay. 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 And Jonathan also had something for Jared. Or maybe it's the same. So I, go ahead, I, Keith, okay. Keith, I'm sorry. There, I wanted to make sure that people knew that they were invited to the update of the uh, BHS BTC construction update. Uh, will be tomorrow night, uh, the third Thursday of every month during this construction in the uh, period of about next two and a half to three years. We'll be doing it every um, 
third Thursday at 5.30 to 9 at Burlington High School Cafeteria. Uh, uh, tomorrow night, I believe we're going to be talking about the phasing of the project, and we're going to start to look at some of the uh, schematic design, which uh, we are expecting Whiting Turner, the uh, major contractor, to come back to us within a week with uh, whether our, our preliminary design will be able to fit the budget that we have for this project. So uh, we've, we've designed it, and now we have to see if we can, if the, pro, if the budget will afford it. Now we'll be, it's what we'll be talking about in the next couple of times th at these meetings. Okay, so we do, we're running out of time again, of course. Which is good, maybe we need more for Speak Out. I like to hear from people. I'll be quick. Um, living off Colchester Avenue, I'm just echoing um, Nancy's concern about people speeding. It's lovely um, and clean, and but people are moving pretty fast. Um, wondering if the um, bike lanes are going to help slow it down or be more dangerous. Um, the other thing is much more minor. I was out there with my hand scythe this morning um, doing the greenway, and I'm just curious about who's in charge of the greenway <laughs> besides a 68-year-old neighbor with a hand tool. Well, good question. Okay, Sharon, head out. So this is Jarrett speaking, even though it's me. Um, so I think Jarrett called a number of people, as he usually does. So um, uh, he, once again, um, and I share this, like Jarrett, are incredibly frustrated with the fact that transportation is focused on bicycles, cars, and never the pedestrian. And I was on the two committee and I thought I made a few inroads getting pedestrians focused on, but now I'm not there. And so once again, it's bicycles, 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 cars, not people. And people need, to, and there needs to be attention. So Jarrett, once again, feels very strongly that Signs need to be posted on Colchester Avenue saying 25 miles an hour to remind people about the speed and that there really needs to be a relook at some of the pedestrian crossings to make sure that they're marked correctly. And um, I'll stop there. Um, I have some ideas, but that's city council stuff. So thank you. Great. So we might have Richard as our last, and then maybe we can do more during another part. Well, um as there is a Burlington Police Department officer with us, so welcome. Um, Jared and uh, Mark Porter and I went to Police Commission a couple of years ago and asked about traffic enforcement when there were manifestly uh, documented, uh, as uh, Nancy said, speedways. Um, and the chief said at that time, uh, we prefer not to do traffic enforcement because it's a bad experience for the driver. Uh, and that's, I, I thought that was the idea. But um, I, I, I wonder if the police officer would care to address that because th there's seldom, if ever, any traffic enforcement in this city. Bicycles, motorbikes, cars, trucks, uh, police vehicles, buses. I was pulled over a few weeks ago, so they're doing something. They got me. They, they got a hold of me. Uh, hi, my name is, is John Murad. I'm the Deputy Chief of Operations, and I'm actually going to be speaking at the next uh, meeting here on, on some of these topics. Um, but I'm, I'm happy to very quickly talk about it. Uh, it, traffic enforcement does still occur, and what we have seen over the the past uh, couple of years with regard to data is that uh, crashes with injury have decreased. Crashes uh, overall have have trended slightly up, but are largely stable. A lot of that has to do with other kinds of uh, developments. That includes uh, really specifically the work that was done on North Avenue, um, restructuring that, and and there was a lot of very strong 
strong uh, data and a, and a very disproportionate decrease seen there owing to road changes. However, uh, I believe that some of that traffic, uh, the, the crash with acts, excuse me, crashes with injuries decrease is nevertheless attributable to officer enforcement, but it's officer enforcement that is now focusing on, on more egregious kinds of driving conduct. And the chief is correct. There has been a dialing back of overall stop enforcement. Um, that's partly because stops are no longer, uh, the department has made it clear to officers that, that stops are, for the sake of, for example, interdiction, are, are not a priority for the department. Um, stops with regard to traffic behavior remain important, especially when that traffic behavior is, as I said, egregious or dangerous. Um, and certainly I'm fully aware in, in NPA meetings like this one or others that I go to that it remains something that people want. Uh, I live in the city. I know people go too fast on the road where I live, and I, I appreciate the desire for uh, enforcement on stop signs and on speed limits on city streets. I appreciate the need for or desire for enforcement with regard to bikes, and that's both sides of the equation. That's the pedestrians, that's the bicyclists, and that's the vehicles uh, around the bicyclists. I believe that we're still trying to work out as a department how to make that happen without uh, emphasizing or overemphasizing enforcement. Um, and if to the extent that we can create changes without that and in collaboration with other parts of the city and, and road development, et cetera, uh, that is something that I think the department's going to continue to explore. That does not mean that we have uh, abdicated our responsibility to maintain road safety. I don't know if that's sufficient for you, but. Uh, <laughs> you will be an active crowd next Thank month. You. And, and, and I'll, 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 I'll have data that goes beyond these, I mean, this anecdote or, or this. Uh, I'll bring uh, a right. report with me that really does demonstrate the numbers for it. Great. Thank you very much. So I know the most challenging part would be to stay on time with this, but we do have Rebecca Thompson from the library that is up next. So welcome. Thank and you. share your, actually, I guess give you this. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Rebecca Thompson. I'm from the Fletcher Free Library. And I'm here to talk about a new volunteer program we have called the Early Literacy Outreach Program. Um, it's a volunteer program that's focused on bringing early learning enrichment to home child cares in Burlington. Um, I've identified 20 home child cares that are in need of services. And I currently have seven volunteers who are out leading story time every week uh, with groups of children in these home child cares. And we're currently recruiting for our second round of volunteers. Um, and our training date for that will be on September 7th at the library. Uh, our volunteers are trained in leading story time at a home child care and provided with everything they need to uh, have story time with books, with songs, with activities, um, and create a really special connection with children and providers and families throughout the city. Um, so I do have some flyers that I will leave over on the table over there if anyone's interested. Um, we have a page on the website, which is FletcherFree.org, um, and it's under the kids section of the website if anyone's interested. And my contact information is on here. Um, if anyone would like to ask any questions right now, I'm happy to talk more about the program. Oh, September 7th uh, from 10 to 2 p.m. And that's at the library? Yes. Yeah. And where is the reading? Where do the people that volunteer, do they go to the library and the group comes, or do they go to the daycare? They go directly to home child cares, who are often not able to transport the children they have. Um, so each volunteer is placed at a home child care throughout the city. Um, they are on a, at a database. I don't have them at the moment. Um, it's pers you know, each volunteer is placed with one and they visit the same one each week. Yeah, I'm okay. I'm sorry. Can you take one? Jonathan. Fett, you're supposed to tell Thank me Thank you. That. Sorry. Oh, me? Yeah. Uh, Becca, maybe could you just talk a little bit about how you ch the process by which you chose the, the centers that you chose for this? Sure. So there's a quality rating system for home child cares and center-based child care. Um, it goes from zero to five, and it's called the STAR program. And 
Uh, there are certain funding opportunities that are available only to centers that are four or five stars. They're considered high quality by the state. Um, and so centers that are zero to three star rated are not eligible for certain opportunities um, and enrichment activities that we feel um, are really important. And so the library's role is, is offering these opportunities to um, centers that wouldn't otherwise have the, the chance to access them. So which are they, four and five or the zero? To Our program reaches zero to three star centers, so they are not considered high quality. Very good. Mark? So who, who's, who's evaluating these programs again? Did you say it was the state? It's a state-run program. It's a voluntary program at the moment, so mm -hmm. um, uh, each center fills out an uh, information sheet. Mm -hmm. Let me restate that. So you said there was an evaluation that was taking place to rate these programs from zero to five. So is, is that a state initiative? It's a state-run program, but okay. it's voluntary. Okay. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. <clears throat> we might be right back on time again. And I do have Liv helping me and helping you um, with these little time cards. So especially when we have the longer presentations, she's going to throw up her two minute and then her 30 second, which means wrap it up. It's kind of hard on speak out. Like sometimes we might need it for that too, but we did good. So now it is time for our Noble city councilors, I guess give you guys both. Maybe I should, well, maybe not, because we're going to have a lot of questions. So this is going to be a um, short, brief, one. brief update. That's a good idea. I'll give you this one. Yeah. Brief update from you folks. And then we, we hope to use this time to really have some questions, because we often don't get to really hear a lot. We have a, usually like a 20-minute span. So, there you go. Great. Um, I can start. So, yeah, I'm Jack. I'm the East District City Councilor. Um, and I guess I'll speak to the resolution that I brought. So, we, had, we only had one meeting in July. It was on, I believe, the 15th. But we just had um, our first August meeting on Monday. Oh, sorry. We just had our first August meeting on Monday. Um, and because we had taken a four week break, it was a pretty heavy agenda. Um, but we didn't get through it all. And, and one of the big items was a resolution that I had brought forward around, it, it relates to F, the F-35s. It's around the basing of a nuclear weapons delivery system at the airport. Um, I could really go down the rabbit hole on this. This has obviously been an issue for a long time. And the Vermont State Senate passed a resolution this year um, around this nuclear component of the, dis of the discussion. And um, the city of Winooski in South Burlington, their city council has also passed resolutions. And this is in response to information around the potential for upgrading F-35s to become nuclear capable. So there's, there's been plenty of mixed messages on whether or not the F-35s that are slated to come to Burlington next month um, would be upgraded or not. I think there's, there's a lot of evidence on either side of that. Um, but this is a precautionary way to ensure that we're at least taking the stance as a community that we absolutely would oppose that and, and don't want to host a nuclear weapon delivery system at the airport. Um, so that was the purpose of the resolution. Um, it passed unanimously. There were, there was an amendment made to it as well that passed. Um, and the amendment spoke to, you know, wishing, this was an amendment by Council President Wright around um, wishing, you know, safe, safe trips when, when the F-35s come and um, also getting the ball rolling on noise mitigation issues. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that for now, but that was the biggest item or the one that we spent the most time on uh, on Monday and I'm happy to answer any questions about that item and I'll let, I'll let them speak uh, to other stuff before we open it up and have more of a conversation. So, um, hi, 
Um, I've been really immersed in a number of, of initiatives that are going on. One is the uh, rewrite of an ordinance that deals with inclusionary zoning for affordability, and I've been I've been part of that process, and I've been tracking it. I've been going to all the planning commission meetings, and it's now come back from planning to the ordinance committee. And Councilor Roof and I are both on ordinance with the chair of is Chip Mason. So um, I just want people to be aware of that. Um, those meetings are. Um, are posted and I encourage people if you have strong feelings about inclusionary zoning to follow along with that. The ordinance um, deals with any number of aspects um, around it. Um, so that's one thing. Um, the other thing that happened, um, I'm glad that I heard you all, you all got your communication about the use of enhanced funds for the NPA. I had I printed it out to make sure that that our NPA knew about how to document those funds, and that's good. Um, but the other important thing that will impact our entire community is that we had a, pre a presentation on reappraisal, which is coming to our neighborhood soon. And so um, that presentation was, um, I want to say that there will be two different groups here. One. One group is going to be looking at the commercial properties, uh, and the other group is going to be looking at residential. And the intent is, and I met with the appraiser on Tuesday after the presentation to just kind of hone in on what I, I felt was necessary for the community to keep you all informed. Um, I suggested that they'd, on the website there would be a like a a bullet, a page that would talk about what constitutes a commercial property and the approach that's going to be used um, and some other factoids. And for residential, the same, um, what constitutes resi residential and the approach and other factoids. For residential, um, there won't be, people are not going to come and do on-site inspections. However, if the property sold within the last three years, they're going to come and visit you. If indeed you did significant improvements to your property, they most likely will come and visit you. You can also request that they come and visit you. Um, so those criteria will be on this page that, um, that they're gonna work on. They also plan to come to every NPA, and the way they're gonna roll that out is that they will, talk to the steering committee and before they actually they're going to take divide this the community up in in sections so when they're going to come towards one and eight they're going to come to the NPA in advance and offer information and give it a, a chance for residents to have a question and answer period um, but they'll do that in each section but what I encouraged them to do was before that just so that everyone had some basic core information was to get that basic info that I just described about commercial and residential out to all the NPAs at the beginning of the process and then when they actually come so everyone will feel somewhat informed and you won't be feeling well I heard in Ward 4 and 7 they've got all this information Where, what about us so I, I really feel like um, there will be a good approach to it and I wanted to highlight that for all of you this is a big deal um, you know, ideally, you're at 100% of market value. We're at about 77% of market value. So there will be some changes, as you know. So um, that's what I want to speak to, and I'll pass it on to Adam. There you go. I'm going to leave most of my time for, for questions because that's the main point of tonight. But I did want to share something um, non-council related but important to me. Um, it's about Lyme disease, and I just want to point out that right now Lyme disease is something that uh, more so than in years past for whatever, I'm actually not sure why, so I'm not the scientist here, but uh, get checked. If you don't feel well, check yourself, have a partner check you. Um, and my mother just got diagnosed with, with Lyme disease, and it's something that we're dealing with now, and um, I want to use my platform here and in other places just to remind people, uh, check yourself and check others because it is a, it's a nasty disease, and it's highly preventable and it's more so preventable if you do contract it early on so if you start to feel like you ran a marathon but you didn't run a marathon 
uh, go and get checked out. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and leave uh, folks time for questions. Who has questions for the counselors? I have a quick question. Here it goes. Um, for Sharon, just a couple things. Um, one, if you could explain what inclusionary zoning is. And then you mentioned a website. Is that on the city or is that a separate website that's going to be established by the appraisers or? What there, you mentioned the inclusionary zoning. I'm just wondering what that is. Um, and you mentioned a website where you ask the appraisers to define what commercial and residential means. Uh, what website are you referring to? And just so that we can have it in the minutes for people to get that information. So the website will be the city website under okay. the department would be, you know, um, the assessor's office. But it's not there, I mean, there's nothing there yet, but that's where you will find that information. Okay. Um, so, let me figure out how I want to approach inclusionary zoning. Do you want to come back to that? So, uh, no, I'm just trying to figure out if in the ordinance there's a definition that I could read, but there is not. Okay, so it's a, it is a method. Um, so when, you, when development is proposed, um, there are criteria to try to create units that are affordable. And so the affordability is if indeed um, it depends on, so inclusionary zoning percentages, let me just, it's complicated. So it's about 15% <laughs> of, of units that are developed. So if you're going to develop a project, 15% of them have to be um, less than 139% of median income. So it's an attempt to make some units affordable for people in our community. And it's an, also an attempt to integrate individuals so that you don't have just um, high-end development. So you would have a, a mix of incomes in development. So on and any development like um, Cambrian Rise, the one out on North Avenue, um, that's got 700 and some odd units, and um, I don't remember the number. We all met with, with um, Eric Farrell, but I don't remember the, the number of units because his percentage, because of different criteria, is higher. It's about 25% of the units are actually affordable. Um, and um, oftentimes, the way developers meet that affordability is they'll partner with Champlain Housing Trust and they will create um, either u buildings that are separate but within the development that are affordable units or um, they will sometimes integrate those units into a bigger building. So the inclusionary zoning ordinance, what, what they looked at was a number of, of issues. One was the fact that some developers, in, in some of these scenarios, if you don't want to build the units within the project, you could build them elsewhere. And so that, they recognized, like in some, uh, some sections of the city, if we're really trying to integrate and make, every, make our community diverse, socioeconomically diverse, you don't want sections of the city that have high-end housing to say, no, I'm not going to build affordable units. I'm going to put them in wards one and eight. I'm not going to put them in ward six. I'm picking on ward six as high end. They're not all high end. But anyways, let's just say that. Um, so they identified that if, 
if 51% of the households are above this median income, you can't, you cannot um, put the units elsewhere. You have to put them within the project. So, but if you're in a community, if you're in the old North End where, where the a median income is lower, then you could actually build these units off-site in another section of the city. Is that proposal, Chair, or the, the, the current law? No, this is proposed. These are changes. Um, the changes also have to do with, um, let me just think about it, percentage. Um, there used to be, um, it, it's a very, it's a huge ordinance, so um, and I wasn't prepared to. I can do a better job by really being prepared to talk about um, other aspects of it. But um, let me just think about some other things I want to share with you. Um, I don't know if Adam. going up. In the beginning, um, and I think that citizens spoke up, they were going to have like the crummy units, the ones that, yes, don't not. I went to every zoning meeting. But they were going to, and even people started calling it the poor door. Remember, and this is in the beginning. They didn't, they weren't allowed to do it because a lot of citizens protested that those inclusionary units needed to be within the whole 14-story development in the housing part, not just the crummy ones that had no window or whatever they had to be. And, you know, and it evolved so that, that it did not end up being that way at the end. But I do remember that that had to do with the inclusion, inclusionary zoning law. The placement of the units, but I don't think that, they, that the developer actually was going to, to, um, to make them crummy units. I think there were, there were, <laughs> They, yeah, I, I don't believe it was that extreme. I think that there was there is always concern when you have a mix of, of incomes um, to make sure that the affordable units are integrated fairly into the development. And so I think we are always very cautious and we want to safeguard to make sure that people, no matter what your means, have the same quality unit that someone else is, is having access to. And I think that really is, that's the intent of this also. Inclusionary units are, are the same quality as the other units also. There's no differentiation, really. Um, um, it's the affordability. Um, one of the sticking points for us was um, the fact that there is a perception that because you don't have a lot of money, that you would um, not have a car. But there are people who actually are on fixed incomes who qualify for uh, affordable units who actually like work out in Williston at Walmart. So the parking component and whether you had to pay for parking and how that adds to the cost of housing, we really didn't solve that problem. What the planning and we and just so you know, the city council, CDNR committee, and the ordinance committee bumped it to the planning commission because we couldn't solve that. And the planning commission ran around and tried to solve it and couldn't either. What they did say, though, was that just because you're in an affordable unit, so, so the number of parking uh, places are impacted by um, the affordable units. So you don't have to provide cars for those units. So, there, so the requirement for parking is less, but the people that live in all the units, whether they're the affordable ones or not, have the same access to parking. So that was the way they tried to deal with it. As far as the price, there was really no way to, we, there was a con conversation around trying to see whether should we, should we put it as part of the um, overall cost of a unit, but then how would you do that? Because it's not really housing, it's parking. Not everybody has a car. And so we that's the best we could do. Um, so I'm going to stop now because I could eat up the entire hour with this. Sorry. <laughs> 
Richard. Uh, city Place was mentioned, so I hope that some sometime during this we will hear about City Place, uh, get a City Councillor's update, but that's not my question. My question is, uh, I'm sorry I wasn't able to go to the uh, City Council meeting uh, because I would have uh, spoken as a staunch supporter of the F-35s and the, uh, and the nuclear deterrent, etc. Uh, not desirable, but I would have spoken uh, in favour of it. One thing uh, that, that's a separate argument, obviously, debate. Uh, but one thing, that when I spoke about it um, eight years ago, whenever it was, um, I reprised something that uh, uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who was a uh, senator for New York, used to publish a, a document every year of the money that came into each state from the federal government and the money that went out and <coughs> excuse me unusually among high tax states vermont was a net receiver of federal largesse um, so my question to the city councillors is if we lost the f-35 mission what thoughts do you have about because that money is going to go somewhere some the, the mission is going to go somewhere someone is going to be the beneficiary, economic beneficiary, if, if we are the loser. So what are your ideas for making up that economic deficit? Thanks. Darn, that's a good question. Um, so two things. So the question is, how would we come up with the deficit? Um, I think you have a responsibility if you, if you yeah. say we don't want that government money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are we going to do to maintain the standard yeah. of living or the quality of life and for I, everyone here. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question to ask, but it's also an opportunity to recognize that that's not a reality that we're going to face um, in the sense that the planes, it, it is an it's a, it's a fact, it's an inevitability. They are coming, and I think that was an important next month, and they're going to come two at a time um, every month until I think, what is the number, 18? Is that what it is? Yeah. Um, so, for or against the F-35s, that's not the question. The question is, how would we be able to backfill that loss? And I think the, the fair answer is we wouldn't be. We just wouldn't be able to. Um, you know, that, that money, I mean, knowing also that that money is unique for the airport, Major, the majority of the money that we get from having that, uh, this base here, uh, is a net benefit from a from one to one basis to the airport mostly the the overflow benefit mostly occurs from the the jobs and the families that that are employed by by that mission so that's the spillover i don't think i don't have the the hard number like the full dollar amount that we get from the various i think there are multiple federal agencies that we get funding from it, it's in the tens of millions and and the alternative would be um to, i don't know, try to raise it through some other revenue stream which would be unrealistic from a from a tax burden standpoint so um, and beyond that I think a lot of the reason why we're allowed the reason we can fund and, and be in a Burlington International Airport um, is because of all the infrastructure that we're able to have because we're a base that's how I understand it and so beyond just losing the, the mission and the jobs uh, we would also have the added difficulty of maintaining the the flights that we have now uh, from a commercial basis and uh, maybe also to a um, um, a commercial uh, on the both the commercial basis as a as a passenger also commercial for for cargo and that such so um, I guess it would be interesting to to map out all the economic impacts both on both ways but that's my best guess on like a back of the envelope math so people while talking going on if they're going to have a question and you just kind of give me that then I'll be on cue to give you that and you so I'm go gonna ahead. I'm gonna be very brief and pass it to Jack so um, I supported the resolution about the um, making sure that they the planes don't or in opposition to nuclear capability for the planes but um, as far as the f-35 and the fact that we what they what having that base there as part of the airport. They provide a lot of in-kind services also as far as um, 
uh, being th there in case there's a fire or an emergency with a plane with a, cr a plane crash. So I, I wouldn't even be able to enumerate all of the things that would disappear if indeed their mission and all of that money went away and they and there was this void now um, I think that it would be it would be such an ec economic hit to our region um, that we would really find ourselves really floundering trying to figure out how to work with our representatives in Washington to figure out what could be done but make um, I think Richard you're absolutely right I don't have an answer I think that um, whether you like having a military base or not, I think that was certainly part of what was contemplated by our representatives in DC. Um, so, that's it. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I can just speak briefly. I think they, they spoke to what would happen if they weren't coming, but it is extremely, likely that they are coming. I don't think this resolution is going to make the Air Force change their mind. Jack, you have to, they are coming. So it's not extremely likely they are, they are coming. Well, they it's are. not under our control. It's not on, it's, it's not under our control, though. I mean, it's up to the, the federal government. The Air government. Force's advanced team is at the airport now planning for the event for mid-September. So yeah. I think it, the, we have to be, be clear with people that the planes are coming. Whether you want them or not, they are coming. Okay. I mean, I, I, I'm not, I think we, we're living under Trump. Okay. So, sure. you know, you could give something 100% certainty from the federal government. I don't think I would do that, but I think it's extremely likely that they will come. I'm just not giving that 100% to Donald Trump's Air Force. We also don't want to, to, we also don't want to be giving folks false hope. I feel that a lot of phone calls and emails over the weekend and on Monday, and I was the one who had to break the news to people that it was, this was not an opportunity to, to stop the planes from coming. And I totally agree and appreciate why the resolution came forward, and I, and I voted for it on all the basis for what, what the resolution was. But for folks out there who still believe that there's a chance to, to enact change and, and prevent them from coming, I, I do think we need to start getting real with folks and saying that I, I'll, you know what, I'll meet you halfway. I will say 99.5% they're coming. So right, I'll, I'll go, meet you there. I'll go 98. I'll okay. go. <laughs> you know, that's what, that's what word one of eight compromise that. looks like. You I just want to make that. sure that people aren't hearing that it's not, it's, it's maybe likely that they're not coming. It's, it is, they're coming. Let's go. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. And I was trying to speak to it. I, that's I know, I I'll going. put this away from me. So Take that away. in the event, the 98%, 99% likely event that they're coming, we, we do have a real, and, and again, they spoke to the question of if they didn't come, which I think is extremely unlikely, um, but we do have a question of, to figure out that I think is, is relevant in the community, and there's been a lot of articles about this recently, but how are we going to pay for the noise mitigation that will be necessary? That still is a problem that is not solved that we need to figure out, so I want to just kind of pivot from that question to a very real question under this reality, which is what we need to figure out as a community. So there, it, there is money from the federal government to deal with soundproofing. You know, initially the, the proposal was eliminating or taking down houses, which was, I I'm didn't like at all. Right. Anyways, that phase is over. Now it's soundproofing, but that money, there is money from the federal government that, that is coming for s homes that are in certain zones. Okay, thank you. Is yours about that 35? No? Okay. Is this about that 35? Yes. Yeah, let's stick on this a minute. I, I do have a question about um, about about city city place, and and that is uh, uh, leaves Jack out because he wasn't there when uh, this project um, was being uh, proposed and, and approved. But but I'd like to know what, what were the what were the major mistakes that you guys feel were made, and how can we avoid them 
in the future. So recently we heard about our bond rating going up and that's great, but conspicuously absent in the, in the kind of public discussion has been what went wrong with uh, you know, the pit happens, uh, city hole and so forth. And I think it's important to, to kind of own up to what went wrong and, uh, and, and to be clear about what people are going to do, what our leaders are going to do to ensure that mistakes of this kind don't occur in the future. Do you want to take first? I've got, I've, I've got five points. So, so I, don't, I don't have points. Um, uh, I just have that. Um, I think that, OK, so what would we do differently? Um, I think every time you um, make a decision and then um, you get to reflect on it, there are things that you learn from it. What would we have done differently? Um, I think perhaps some people would have um, chosen to take, it's tricky still to speak about some of the things that are in executive session and, and Michael, this really bothers me because I feel like I'm a cloak and dagger, but I think, diff I think people would have made different decisions um, at certain key points in our process. Initially going into it, I think everybody um, felt that there was a project that whether you supported the project height or not, but the, the combination of what it was gonna bring downtown with commercial space, retail, and, and residential, everybody felt like that was what our downtown needed. So I don't think there would have been any difference there. Um, would we have along the way um, had built in more checks with the developer? Perhaps. I think maybe that really is one of the things that we would have done um, differently. Um, I think, you know, communication is always key. And I think that communication on a more regular and frequent basis, more direct communication with the council, I think would have been an improvement also. That, those are the things that I can really share with you. Um, as far as what went wrong for the um, developer along the way, things happened, costs got, costs rose, um, and they had to rethink their project, and that built in some delays. Um, I don't know if any one of us could have anticipated some of the things that happened in our economy. Um, and so that requires really having a crystal ball, and I, and I don't think any one of us do. But certainly, um, there were some things I, as a city councilor, see I could have done differently to make that communication clearer, make me better informed, so that when I got an update, that I asked the right questions and understood exactly where we were. So that's what I can tell you. Uh, I've thought about this a lot, and I think that if, if I could go back, the, the one thing that I would do would, would, would force ourselves to have the conversation in the context of Macy's. Of what? Of what? Of what? The, the, the oh, former Macy's building. Um, yeah. The, all right, you asked for it. What I, uh, what I would have done, uh, well, the, one, the, main, the primary thing that I would have done differently, because um, I, I, I think this is realistic, would have forced the conversation, at least anecdotally, to have a, a discussion with the developer around what would happen if Macy's were to close. Because they were giving us every single signal possible that they were going to close. Obvious. It was obvious they were going out. Yeah. And, and that's the main thing that I wish that I did. And I'll own up to that. Um, because if we were having the conversation then in context of Macy's, in many ways we'd be having the conversation that we are now. And we would have been able to envision the, the programming and the, the scale and scope and massing and the programming as they call it, the mix between residential, commercial and office. Um, though we would have been able to realize that with more space this way, you don't need as much space this way. And I think that's the primary piece that I would, would, have, would have thought of. Now, there are some other items that I think were, were kind of required 
would have required a crystal ball, but they're, they're just as important to recognize to understand how we've gotten to where we are today. And so in addition to that Macy's piece coming in after we did a lot of the, the scoping and ideation around what the project will look like, um, I think that it, I wish that we had known that Don Sinex was going to get bought out by Brookfield, who's just a, it's just a different beast. Um, Brookfield operates a lot differently. In many respects, I would say that they operate better than, than Don Sinex. I think Sharon would agree, having worked with Don as well. Um, but they're not perfect, right? They're bigger than Don, so they move a little bit slower. Um, they're bigger than Don, so they have more lawyers <laughs> who cause things to go slower. Uh, so that would have been one. Also, and, and this is said without judgment um, to the suitors, but one thing that I did not contemplate was that once this project got go, once it was greenlit, it was met with a, a lawsuit that lasted, I think it was eight or nine months or something. Again, without judgment to that lawsuit, that was a, a delay where nothing was happening on the site. And then coupled with that soon thereafter when deconstruction happened, they found asbestos and that added another couple of months. So call it really the first year. The lawsuit did not delay the project eight or nine months by any means. What was the timeline? Because I've been, I've been trying to find out. It was a few months because it, the, the, the lawsuit uh, resulted in, in a settlement uh, that was uh, yeah. brokered by Peter Clavel, and that allowed the project to go forward. A few, so I'll say a few months. The, maybe, the, maybe it, I, I mean, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, was, it was a short day. period of time. Maybe six months. I think six is more. No, 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 no. Four months for asbestos. No, I think it, I don't know, Tony, do you know? I think it might have been a no, month. Guys, guys, again, not judgment. Oh, how about this? I'll make it really no, I'm just I'm just saying that there was not there was not any serious delay as a result of that lawsuit. None. There, there was a 500. And, and there was no serious delay as a result of the lawsuit. There was the. The lawsuit that w was settled in order to allow the project the to go time, forward. Time frame huh? for when the, the lawsuit was filed to when it was settled. I, I don't either. I, I don't know the exact the exact so numbers, was, but to suggest that it's nine months is a gross exaggeration. I, I mean, thought, that's I like told, by 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 like a, many orders of magnitude. It'd be fantastic if we could find out how long that. It lawsuit would be easy was. to find out. Uh, that would be. I'll awesome. let you know. That'd so. be great. So with the lawsuit plus the asbestos, there was some, even if you want to call it on a combined matter, uh, uh, several months. Again, I'm just giving some context here. I'm not attacking. I couldn't say it any different. No judgment to the, to the suitors. But there was a lawsuit that did add a wrinkle to this, and they did come. I, I guess what I'm saying, I Adam, wrinkle. is that what I'm saying is that the project was not viable, and I would like someone in the city to recognize that they approved a project that was not viable, and this is this is a, at at a huge cost to the city of Burlington as a result of the the poor judgment okay. that they exercised and the lack of due diligence, despite repeated claims of doing due diligence. So I'm just looking for, if I make a mistake, I'll acknowledge that mistake. Yeah. And I think that's what people should do when they make mistakes. And I don't see any of that. What I, what I see instead is people, before it was all about, um, it was all about, you know, public-private partnership. And now it's like, oh no, that's private development, not my problem. I don't think that's been said once. I don't know, I think it's an executive session. Excuse me, but I mean, is, is, there, is there an opportunity for me to finish my comment yeah. about City Place? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Because that would be that, that would be great. Because I think what's important to recognize is that there was due diligence done. And Michael, if you could sit down and point, and I would, I've, I've invited people to do this, including folks in this room, this to sit. To, excuse me, may I? Because I, I was quiet with your with your statement. What would be interesting is to look at what we knew then, and point direct to to some specific things that, and I'll leave Jack out of this. But what your city councilors had information in front of us, and we made a decision based on that information. Right, I, I, I can't be more clear about this, that there are the, major, the, the contributing factors that led to where we are today were only identifiable through a crystal ball. And if, you're, if you feel different about that, I wanna look at the, at the facts of the matter and the details and identify exactly where you think there was a mistake. Because I will own up to mistakes. My mistake was not forcing the conversation around Macy's. That was a gross mistake, Michael. But the notion that somehow we were to expect that Donald Trump would be elected on the same night that this community voted in favor to approve the TIF financing and the zoning overlay, if we could to, were to have been able to anticipate that, we would have maybe have been able to have guessed that global markets that did impact the bids for this project 
which were estimated during the early 2000 and mid-2016 time period, which was a different world, folks. Again, this is not me trying to validate my vote. I'm trying to be frank, upfront, and honest about the true dynamics of what has led to this issue. The truest issue with this is that the bids came in 10, 15, 20% higher than they should have been, right? And that is only, that is only related to global market shifts because there were internal reviews and you might not trust the city. They were, and I, I, can't, I can't convince you to trust me, I can't. It was the internal review of the city. It was the external review that we brought in. Our development professionals looked at us in, the, in, the, in, in our eyes and told us that this was a viable project based on the financial global markets that we were assuming, as well as the developers' assessments. And so with that triad of input, I'm confident in my decision I would make it again if I had to go back. If I knew what I knew now, we would do things differently. Of course. Of course we would. But the notion that we were going to anticipate that Macy's was going to get sold and bought up and brought as part of this. The notion that we were going to know that Brookfield was going to take over Don Sinex's stake. I'm kind of glad that happened. And the notion that we were going to know that, that Don Sine uh, Don Sinek, Donald Trump was going to throw our global markets into a bit of a topsy-turvy state and our bidders were going to be 30% higher than they were supposed to be. I, I, wish I, I wish I could have known. I wish I could say I made a mistake and that I knew that was going to happen. Damn it, I wish I could but there was no way for us to know that. No way. So I know I'm probably not supposed to speak up, but I just want to say, I guess for me, the biggest problem is that, well, one, I didn't know that Don Sinex was bought out. I thought he's 49 and Brookfield is 51. He's no longer in control as we do. But he's still he's in there. Control. Okay, that's what I thought. So he has not been bought out. I just wonder, is that new news? But the money. The, the my biggest problem is that in basic 101, you know, doing an addition on your house, you do not tear down something until you have the money in place. And I have two people that were, you know, they're retired now, but they were contractors. And I all along kept talking to them. One lives in Idaho, one lives in North Carolina, family members. And I'm like, there's no bonding on this. Like, there was no money. And so to me, that's the part about the viable project. And yes, and don't forget, PC walked off the job. It wasn't that, do you remember this? I mean, PC walked off the job. That's why nothing started happening. I mean, so it, to me, the biggest problem was there was no money to um, do the project. And as the city, we should have had more checks, like you said, and we should have not let anything be torn down until we knew there was money, we knew that something else was going to go up, because now we all have a big hole in the ground, and it is costing us money. So that's the problem. We are totally losing on that. Does anyone else want to speak up on this or something else? Jonathan. Yeah, I was actually, I was actually going to talk about uh, the, the appraisal, that Sharon, that you brought up, but I was going to make a little rant about City Place in the meanwhile. I want to make that rant, but before I do, I, I want to say that I'm, I'm really not a big believer in placing blame. What I'm a believer in is learning and doing something differently next time. So it's, it's wonderful to reflect and it's wonderful to mea culpa, but the really important thing to do is to, is to and it may be too early for it, but to get a group of people together, do, a, do some serious problem solving on this and make sure the same thing doesn't happen again. That's, that's what matters. It doesn't really matter who did what in the past. What matters is not doing it again. Okay. So let me, if, if I can just get back to the appraisal because, because um, you, you mentioned communication and to me communication is absolutely the most important piece of all of this. Um, and the reason why I was going to raise City Place was because my understanding is that the city is having daily conversations with Brookfield on, on what's going on. We heard this at a city council meeting sometime in the past. Daily. And it's 15 or 20 days since that started. I think the city should be telling the public what's going on in those conversations. Doesn't have to be a lot of detail, but it's like radio silence right now. I asked, this, I asked City Hall if they, could do, if they could present something on a regular basis. The response was, Brookfield will talk about this. It's not Brookfield's job to talk about it. We don't, you don't work for Brookfield. You work for us. The mayor doesn't work for Brookfield. The mayor works for us. You need to communicate what's going on. 
That's really important. And that's where I get back to the appraisal. <laughs> um, I'm very excited about the appraisal, by the way, and I'm a, I'm a real believer in reappraisal I, because I, I'm a real believer in um, in equity. Because the real the, what people comp, what people worry most about, in my opinion, is that they're somehow being cheated because their next door neighbor is paying less tax than they are. Equity is the most important thing in a city. The the present I saw part of the presentation at least the presentation started with a cartoon that showed what people fear most about reappraisals and there were half a dozen things the first one was my taxes are going to go up and I was disappointed that the presentation didn't address any of those things and and in retrospect it's probably not the re, uh, the appraiser's job to answer those fears but it is the city's job to answer those fears I'm I'm on the board of assessors. I, I, I work very closely with John Vickery. We get along great. I urge him to make sure there's a good communication plan with the city, uh, with, with the public. I would urge you to work on a communication plan because that's what it's all about. There has to be a strong communication plan now as it goes forward and when the, when the, when the figures come out. And then everybody will feel comfortable about it. But it's got to be a real active communication plan. And, and it's got to be thought of as a plan. Somebody has to own it and work on it. And there's my two cents. Thank you very much. Thank you. The day after I heard, on the 13th, I met with John and said, it's about communication. And, and so, so I agree with you. Um, I agree that the city as a whole needs the communication. Communication is key for any topic, whether it's city, place or whether it's reappraisal or whether it's the F-35, whatever. Communication is key. And so I'm doing the best I can with the reappraisal to make that happen. I, and, um, I feel like I work for the city now. I mean, I, 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 in all honesty, I'm spending a tremendous amount of time in City Hall and, I, and it's fine. But, you know, I, I can't cover it all because I just can't. But I do meet with departments and try to make sure that people get the information they need. As far as city place, I would like to say Sharon Bush, you know, resident of city of Burlington, feels as frustrated as all other residents in this room that maybe the city is getting communi daily communications, but this city councilor has heard nothing. And so I came tonight thinking, what am I going to answer if you ask me what's an update on City Place? Because I know nothing. And we were told and we asked for have, to have weekly updates. And we have not had those. So um, before this meeting, Adam and I briefly talked. And we're on the same page that we need to get those updates. This is ridiculous. You know, even if it's to say, whatever whatever that you know this hasn't happened but this is where we're at just to restate maybe where you're at and we haven't had any movement on this why we'd like to know and as much of that should happen at the beginning of each city council meeting i mean we don't have many of those and an open session as much as as it can happen because all of you want to know the same thing too where are we where are we now we're not really losing money but we are delaying our downtown and we do worry we do watchdog when all of you talk about what you know what's going on i worry too um we had this plan about um downtown and uh transportation and uh, uh, uh the, the business community and DPW working with a transportation plan for downtown and for the holiday season and how important it was I stated to have free parking downtown because we have some stores down there we want to make sure they succeed we do measure their success we try to evaluate how we're doing but I, I mean I'm worried just like all of you I, will this when is, the, when is the bottom going to drop out? It hasn't dropped out. I know you're all worried. It hasn't dropped out. It's still a project that is, to the best of my knowledge, is a viable project that has been significantly delayed. And I need, just like all of you need to know, 
when are we going to see some activity. Once we know when they begin, they'll then be able to tell us what the anticipated timeline is. But before they begin, they're not willing to give any kind of detail like that. So I, I share your frustration as a resident. I, I feel like I know all of you see me as failing you. I'm not trying to fail you. I'm really trying to keep you in the know. But I'm having difficulty getting the information myself. So Sharon, is there, is there a way that your constituents can help you get that information? We, we'd we like Brookfield to come to this meeting next. I think they have nothing to report. I mean, yeah, that's right, because they don't know anything, so because they're not yes, telling you. We would like to, I know you want to have them, and I think it would be really important to have them come. Hopefully well, I just when read in the newspaper they that say. they were, I, last, I read in the newspaper they were going to the NPAs, and so that they had gone to Ward 2-3, they went to Ward 6, so I was hoping we could get them here because Moreau was saying that also, that they were going to all the MPAs, but we never saw them. So that's why I had asked if our city councilors, because Fett told me that Karen Paul is the one that set it up for them. So that happened, you know, right when Brookfield kind of took over for Dawn. And that was, and, and then, you know, people went on summer vacation, basically. However, um, you certainly, we certainly can make that happen. We'd like to be able to have them be able to say something to you, right. as opposed to if you've watched the, the public, the meetings, and you've seen the interaction, I think all three of us will agree that you don't really learn much from the interaction right now. So is it early then to ask for them, maybe? Well, I don't know. I, I, okay. I, uh, maybe there'll be activity soon. Here you go. Thanks. Um, I mean, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to ask them, even if they say they don't have anything to say, because I think it's a good opportunity to get them in front of us and at least try to push them and try to have some type of dialogue. Um, it might be limited what they can say, but I at least want to know whatever they're willing to share, if that's of interest to people. So I feel like we can invite them to for next month, unless people want to wait. But I'd rather get them in the hot seat sooner than later, personally. But. Been, so so Will, Will Vogel and, and Chelsea Ziegelbaum are the two names that may sound familiar. Um, what, I, what I may or may not be able to share, I don't know these days, the lawyers will get me if I'm wrong, but um, they are planning to grow their, their team. Um, and I don't know much more than that. I, I, do, I do know that they're planning to grow that team so that they can have more folks here locally, either permanently or semi-permanently, I don't know. I, I, I do know that they're intending to grow their team. And when I talked to them last, I did say, I said two things. Well, I said a lot of things. <laughs> I said, you kind of have two problems, right? You have, a, you have a construction problem. You also have a communications problem, right? On the construction side, that's what you do well, it seems. You're the biggest in the world. You must be good at it. You're not doing a great job on the PR side of things. And use your, at very least, use your city councilors to, to help you with that. And so I, I told them, you, you got to come to the MPAs. I know you made some tours. They wanted to, they, they pulled back, frankly, because that last update the city council they gave us was kind of, I almost swore, it wasn't, it was kind of thin. Um, and they, no it was no update. It was, a, it was an updateless update. And they got flack for it, as they should have. And I think what they're, I actually can, to a degree, you can appreciate this. They don't want to give an update again unless they have something to update us on. And so if they were to come back and say, the update is we have no update, I'm probably going to throw something at them, right? And I know they don't want to do that. So they, they've been asked. They have committed. They said they, they will come. I'm hoping for here for September or October when they have a substantive update to give. And hopefully then it's not just those two who aren't in Burlington very often. And I do think we need someone who is here locally, if not permanently, a whole bunch of time, if not from here, are here, or at least has familiarity with the, uh, w with the area. Because I do think that, uh, like, like John said, communication is really half the battle here. They have, and it's an easier problem to fix. Shoot, I said, look, take a full page ad out in seven days and introduce yourself to the community. That would go a long way. Don't even update anything on the project. Just introduce yourself, and people in Burlington tend to respond well to that. More of an update would be nice, but y you got to be seen.
I have. No, I thought we'd go to 825. 820. Um, I have a question about that. Do you think that the size of Brookfield might may be making City Place less of a priority for them? Do you, see how <laughs> hard it is to hear? Do you think that the size of Brookfield is making our city place less of a priority for them? They've got a lot of irons in the fire, a lot of money on the line elsewhere, I'm sure. So could we be a very low priority for them? And is there anything, anything we can do to encourage them? Uh, they've got about 50 million um, committed in, in, in the pit already. Um, so there, they're, they're, there are they're, few, like a four. I don't know how yeah, much yeah, they're no, worth it's, now. Uh, it's Tens rounding, of billions. It's a rounding error for for their overall budget. We, that's for sure. I haven't gotten that sense. Um, well, well, let's be fair, right? Whatever. If they're they're probably building some skyscraper in Kuala Lumpur or something, that's probably a higher on if, if brass tax, probably higher on the list of priorities. But I don't think they only have one priority list. I know that the, the their director of construction is focused on this. They are not ignoring it. They are doing work. And frankly, a lot of the, and we kind of glazed over it, but um, I didn't get to it. This is an important piece. Don Sachs is still involved in the project, but a lot of work, a lot of dancing had to happen to get him to take the back seat, right? So having him be a 49% partner in the project still did not mean that he still wasn't driving the ship. And a lot of work had to go in to to take him off the the steering wheel. I know ships don't have steering wheels, but um, that was a that was a big a big lift, and that was a major update that frankly got lost because of that silly delay that happened. We had that Monday night executive session, and then Tuesday that there was remember like that comment in the hallway that happened, and that spooked everyone. We didn't get that darn update until later that later that week. Because that was lost, that now Don Sinek's not just as a 49% partner, but also not driving the ship anymore. And I think that's good. So I want to answer your question by, I, as I was walking over here, I was beginning to think that I, I do believe we're not a priority for them. That's my gut. And I think that it's because they don't have a dedicated person here, and they need a dedicated person. And so they can tell me that we're a priority, and they have told me we're a priority. But just like I can tell you something, you want me to prove it. You want me to show you. I want them to show me. Show me we're a priority by, by being here, by communicating regularly, and by showing, taking some small steps towards beginning the project. That's what shows that we're a priority. And so I agree somewhat with you that I think we are small fish. And, you know, I, I'm concerned about that. We are just about out of time with the city council. Do you still have your F-35 comment you'd like to make? Oh, yeah, the F-35. <coughs> I, was, I was just um, wanting to um, okay. um, make a comment on um, the, um, <coughs> I think this is really, due diligence conversation. Um, I know we're having a conversation right now about something that's already happened uh, and it's very important, but something's getting ready to happen and here's an opportunity to get in front of it. So um, it occurs, I'm a retired Army vet, okay, so I just want to let you know I'm a retired Army officer and I also know that I understand the presence of the military here in Vermont and have a lot of respect for it, quite frankly, okay? And I think that um, it's important to understand that the, the Air Force is not the only folks here. The Army folks are here as well. Um, I, as much as I think it's unfortunate that we're viewing this as a revenue issue, because uh, it seems like we always get ourselves uh, in a little bit of a pinch when we start looking at our moral issues as revenue issues. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to um, just state that, uh, because at some point or another, it shouldn't matter if it's a revenue issue, if it's a real moral issue. Okay, um, and I think the the other thing is is that um, I'd like to see some numbers. You know, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to see some spitballing and what does it look like? You know, what does what does it look like if the Air Force changed their mission, um, or if or if they didn't have a mission here? What does that look like in in terms of dollars and cents? If if you're concerned about dollars and cents, um, and um, and also. Um, 
to what extent in this we can take this uh, the answer to this question you know maybe in a continuance of this conversation in another meeting or offline after this meeting but what is the conversations that you're having at the statewide level about this because it seems like you've already, you've made a symbolic vote and you've resided to the fact that the vote really meant nothing and um, the question is is you know are we really are you are we having conversations are you having conversations at at the statewide level on the um, the prospect of the Air Force um, moving out, moving, moving the F-35 mission out, uh, and are you having real conversations with our um, our delegation, our congressional delegation as well? Um, not just to affect change to the extent that what would occur next month, but there's a month after next, and there's a year after this, and there are five and ten and twenty years later. Okay, so that's that's the uh, the thought process that I have on the 35s. Thanks. So. We really are supposed to go on now to your presentation. Oh. Uh, do you did you forget? Yeah. Oh, okay. So do you do you want to answer no, from that? No, or I mean, I feel like I mean, in all fairness, yeah. I think they should have an opportunity to say yeah. something. Okay. And I'll just cut back on my presentation. Okay. If that's necessary. I'll try to make two quick points. Um, Thirty and, seconds. Uh, oh. <laughs> Jesus. All right, ready. Go. Um, the first vote, I, I, I thought about this, and maybe you can speak to this, but the first vote I think the city council took re related to F-35s was five years ago from Monday. So there was a lot of stuff that happened leading up to Monday, and conversations with state and feds did happen as well. Also, as part of that resolution that was passed on Monday, there was a report uh, th that was asked to be done to get back to the city council from the airport around that noise mitigation effort. So we will be seeing some numbers on a going forward basis with how the process is going on that front. Okay, thank you. Go. So, are, are you cutting me yeah, off? Or? No, go ahead, because well, I'm waiting for Mark. He's on, he's on show right uh, now. He's setting up. So really quickly on the Brookfield thing, I think another reason off of what um, the other counselors had just said, I think getting him in front of here in front of us sooner than later to put them on the spot in terms of their commitment to Burlington and maybe they don't have an update but at least we can press them on what their commitments are what their plans are going forward will they continue to be communicative and hit them on that that PR side so to speak as Councillor Roof said um, but on the F-35s yeah I think what all we can do is is push the the state and federal level and that's that was the intention of the resolution in part. If you look at, at the actual resolve clauses of the resolution, it is that we're requesting that the congressional delegation, the mayor, the governor, inform the acting U.S. Secretary of St Defense that the city of Burlington strongly opposes, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, that is the idea, is to be pushing at the state level and using that to push up to the federal level. Yeah, and so uh, I'm just going to tell him, Mark, that, oops, he's walking with Adam. So, Mark, so as as Adam stated, you know, this, the F-35 conversation started quite a while ago, and so a lot of the constituencies that you referenced, state and then federal, as far as our reps, weighed in early on um, and were very clear about what it meant to the community, what it meant, not only economically, but what it meant um, for our ability to be the kind of state we wanted to be. And so um, uh, there's a lot of history there, and we'd have to go back and look at it all in order to actually answer some of these questions. Yeah. That's, um, is there any volume coming out of there? We'll try. We'll try it. We'll, if, it, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, I, we'll we'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. No, it's fine. Uh, what's this guy doing on here? I, I, just, I just clicked the first video on YouTube. What do we got? Did Jonas you? Brothers. Did you? Stuff. Did you really? So no, no, no. You, you just need dance. to. Uh, okay, so click here. A dance. Here. Get rid of that. Yeah, okay. See you later. Uh, and you want to get to your PowerPoint? Yeah, I had right there. Uh, one second. But sure, I, everything's I had, over. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll see. And if that if that video works, it does it. If it doesn't, that's great. Well, we're not even going to really even talk about that. But that okay, thanks. So, I'm Mark, I'm uh, Ward 1, and I think I know mostly everybody in the room. I want to give a shout-out to John. Thanks for showing up. Good to see you. 
Uh, also, the city councilors and y'all, I see you back there as well, and the rest of you live. Thanks for uh, hooking us up and getting me in. I'm going to tell you very briefly a couple things about uh, something that's planning. Uh, some, most of you know that I'm with um, Justice for All, racial justice organization in the area, and we're also running a um, uh, the Racial Justice Alliance, which is a policy-based organization that's doing a lot of stuff uh, at the statewide level, as well as we're working with the city council, too. So we stumbled across some history, and we found out that down in Hampton, uh, what's going on right now is, is the there's a 400-year 400, 400 commemoration. You probably saw the president went down uh, to Hampton about a week or so ago uh, in, in, uh, to participate in activities in that commemoration. Um, as we all know, our first government was formed in uh, Jamestown and down in that area, um, in the House of Burgess and so forth. Uh, also, what was going on during that time in 1619 in late August, about 20 Africans stepped off a ship called the White Lion that ported at a place called Comfort Point, which is now referred to as Hampton, Virginia. Um, that pla those 20 African Americans, those 20 Africans at that time, um, were skilled Africans, cultured Africans, uh, Africans uh, who had skills such as uh, uh, blacksmith uh, irrigation, um, uh, diff other, other types of skills, and then I think part, part of that is going to come out uh, in the uh, presentation on, on the event. What I came to tell you about is just the event itself, is, is it's on the 24th. What we decided to do is, is to kind of mirror what's going on in Hampton and, and to begin, begin a, um, in a tradition of having this event on an annual basis here. And we're calling it an African Landing Vermont. Uh, we came across some uh, research that was done with the commission that was stood up. Uh, there was some legislation that was passed last year, which is why this slide is up. Uh, le legislation that was passed last year to, to um, create a commission, a 400-year commission, um, to um, to provide technical assistance as well as to to assist in 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 uh, the um, planning act activities across the, the United States. So they weren't funded. <laughs> uh, so uh, what we're doing is is we're we're swinging uh, by a bootstrap. So what we decided to do, and I, I put out some of these um, presentations, some of these uh, slides to some folks, um, and you can you can take it with you if you want to, or put it up, or throw it away, or use it for something else. But what what, what we're doing is is we're kind of get try, just trying to get the word out. So what I came to tell you is is all about this. I have a really brief video to show you that kind of summarizes it a little bit better. If, if we can get the sound up on it, I will. If, if not, then you can probably just go and Google it and find a, find a video yourself and you can figure it out. Um, I got a, I've got a card that has asks on it. I'm going to put it right here because it's going to be the last thing I do. Is, um, but I just wanted to share with you some of the sponsors really quickly because I thought you might be interested. Um, the Episcopals of, of Vermont are, are major sponsors. Also, the city of Burlington. I just wanted to let you know that Twin Craft and Ben, ben and Jerry's chimed in, and Disability Rights Burlington Vermont Schools. Thank you, y'all. Um, as well as uh, UVM, um, the Vice President of Equity and, and uh, HR, that, that office there. Uh, then there's a number of private donations that have also come in, so I'm encouraging you as well to assist us with this if you can, please. Um, we, um, oh, I was, I'm not supposed to ask yet. That's on that card. So those are some of the folks um, that have um, asked, to, that have agreed to help out. I'll tell you a little bit, a little bit about uh, some of the uh, lineup: dancers, uh, singing, food, um, singing, and food and food and drumming and and fun. Um, but the, what what we're going to do is, is also we, we have a a. Um, a a speaker lined up as well, and we're kind of trying to still get that figured out, so we're keeping it a little bit of a surprise, but I'm not quite sure if it's going to work, but we'll see. Uh, we're doing all of this, we're bootstrapping all of this, everything, we're just, just it's, we're literally flying by the seats of our pants. It is exciting, it's ex exhilarating, but it's also very stressful. Um, so um, please help. Uh, we're going to put up a facility for volunteers up on our website. So if you can, if you can help us out in any way, hands, feet, hearts, minds, all of those things, we really need your support at, in any capacity whatsoever, supporters, volunteers. Uh, communications, we're going to be, we, we have began the process of tweeting, of uh, Facebooking, of Instagramming. Um, Sharon's looking at me like, what? <laughs> and and um, so, so there's a lot of communications that's going on. We're email blasting this as well. So if you happen to stumble across something, pass it along. Just pass it along because it helps, it helps a lot. Um, 
there is a facility that we had we intended on just allowing it to be free and just have folks just come and but then we said well, well we won't know the capacity so then we went and tried to put up a, a little um event bright you know what i mean and try to, to track everything so it's free but it's on event bright so it's really complicated and then it's on facebook and there's an event on facebook and it's just it's a mess okay so go out sign up any way you can try to give us an idea that you're coming and that leads to the next pl pl uh, point which is please be present this is uh, an event that is for um, all of us, okay? It's about our history. It's about all of our history. It's not just about um, the, the Africans who came here to the United States. It's about, you know, who we became as a nation and who we became as a world as a, re as a result of it, okay? So please, please be present, okay? And, and bring your friend with you. Bring your housemate with you. and Bring the people across the street that you don't like with you, Um and, and then finally, sponsors, 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 sponsors. I'm going to try to pull this thing up uh, in just a second, but sponsors are, are incredibly important. I just, I just named off a few of them. I don't see anybody reaching for their checkbook, so I, I don't think I've done very well here, but think about it. Um, so if you just go out to the website, and I'm going to give you, well, it's right here. Um, there's the website. If you can go out to the website, if you can go out to, you could, if, if, you, if you'd care to volunteer before we get the facility up on the website, just send an email, <clears throat> excuse me, to that, to that email address and somebody will respond to you because th they will not let you get away if you want to volunteer. You will never, ever get away ever again. Um, no, I mean, you will we'll use your help this time and we may contact you next year is what I meant to say. Um, so you'll find us on... Um, you see the you see the web address. Okay, follow us though. Follow us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Follow us on Instagram as well. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. I'm going to, I'm going to forego the the, uh, the video in the interest of time because we've we've gotten behind because that hole in the ground is really important. Thank you for your attention. Bye. Thank you very much. So, okay, one question from Sharon Busher. If you come, the question is, is if she comes to the event, will she find out where, where Point Comfort is? Yes, you will. And not only that, nobody in this room will ever know where it Can is. Can you see down there? <laughs> this, is, this is true. I'm going to take, if you don't mind, just one more Wait, 30 hold second. This. Hold one more 30 second question, because I saw, I think I saw your finger go up. Is that, no? You didn't have a question? Okay, so we're done. Are we done? Everybody clear? Are we good? Thank you so much. Here you go. Maybe you could right help. You had your, is that the right spot you put it in? I don't know. You pulled it out. You pulled it out. Here, I can help you. I can, here, let me see. Let me see here, real quick. Let's go. Well, Adam, Adam's doing it. We need our AV director. Need I can. Plausible deniability. All right, gotcha. Here? No? Yep. That's it. All right, please. Uh, I'll give them present mode here. So, I didn't even know that one. Yeah. New version. Very good. Thank you, Adam. Which one? Testing. One, two, three. So there's no. You there's have no to application. Speak up. No, but you need to speak with that. Is it the right one? There's three of them here. No, this is it. That's good, unless you want a cord. Mm, yeah. No, this is good. Well, that's good. All right. Can I start? Welcome. Yes. This Thank you very much. Superintendent. Yeah, okay. I'm Yal Bang. I think I've seen most of your faces before throughout the uh, course of my tenure. Happy summer, and I'm glad to see everyone out engaged during August. You know, I've been saying happy summer to people, and people are like, it's not over yet, especially our, our staff who are coming back. And uh, I'm thankful to have this opportunity to come and share with you uh, some of the great things that has happened um, in our district. Uh, we've had some really good support from the community over the last few years in terms of supporting our budgets and supporting our bonds to build high schools and, and other things. So I wanted to take the opportunity to go out and start sharing in terms of the work that, that's happening. And um, every year uh, I do a year in review uh, of some highlights for the, uh, for the board so the board can kind of see from different perspectives in terms of what's, what's happened. And this year, after I did, I was kind of reflecting back because um, I'm actually entering my fifth year 
here in Burlington. And I was like, wow, oh my goodness, time has flown by and started reflecting back when I first arrived. And, um, you know, like most things, you know, when I got into the role here at Burlington, I thought I was knew what I was getting into, but there are always some nice little surprises, right? That uh, can, so when I, <laughs> so one thing we, we found out was there, there was actually a deficit in our budget. You know, I thought it was just some challenges. Uh, we've had a number of leadership t turnover in a short period of time, so that adds some instability around that. Um, there, were, there, there were racial tensions. Uh, among students and staff and um, and there are some real issues that we had to uh, address and deal with and there were some structural things in our finance department and our human resources uh, department as well too but we quickly got back to work and some of you were probably a part of our community engagement process when we did our strategic planning and we did a, a large consultation and got lots of good feedback and got to understand a little bit better what the um, the needs and wants of Burlington. And that gave us our uh, strategic plan goals, which is sustainable finance and facilities, equitable climate and culture, and inclusive teaching and learning, right? So I was kind of reflecting back and saying, okay, well, you know what? We actually have moved the, the rock up the hill a little bit. Um, so that gives you a little bit of context for those of you who I didn't meet when I first came, um, where I'm coming from. And I'm, I'm really proud and happy to be uh, sharing this after fourth, my fourth year and entering our fifth year. And I think this is gonna be one of our best years ever because we've been able to put some structures and processes in some of the logistical things and we're now shifting the organization around really the, the level of engagement sort of in the classroom engagement and working with our board to set up some structures and to have high achievement for all students. So let me uh, share with you, it's a quite a long presentation so I'm not going to um, go through everything but I wanted to give you a flavor and if you're interested um, go on to our, our site. You can go on to the superintendent, go superintendent, and it's one of the first things right on the board website on their uh, superintendent page. You can click on it and you can peruse through it page by page. It's good night reading if you want to get to sleep, <laughs> stuff like that. But uh, um, I'll, I'll endeavor to try to just expedite it a little bit, otherwise we'd be here for several hours. And this is quite a challenge because we do get a lot of submissions from all our staff and students in terms of the wonderful things they've done and it's hard not to include everyone, right? Because people feel like, oh, well, we did this, this was so amazing. And you know, I say, yeah, it is, but it, it can only be a thousand pages, so <laughs> we can't go on. So here we go. Let me uh, see if I can get this. We can skip that. Uh, this is what I, I kind of talked about this a little bit in terms of our three main goal areas. And fortunately for us, when we developed this, and this came from the, the feedback from our community, and we established these big rocks, I call them, and then the agency came out with their priorities for us, and we found that it really aligns with what we're doing. So we're like, Phew. you know, so our inclusive teaching and learning align with the academic proficiency, personalized, high quality, and the safe, healthy schools align with our equitable climate and culture initiatives and our investment in priorities around our sustainable finance and facilities. So that was a great alignment, and we were like, Phew. Great, we did all that work and we can report back to the Agency of Education and they can see the alignment of what they're pushing as a, as a state that Burlington is right in line with um, where we're going as well. I'll skip that. So I've kind of chunked it under the, um, the three goal areas. Um, so, no? Yeah, so it, we're, it's in this fourth year and it's been very successful. Um, every year we get a whole, um, cadre of graduates of parents who are engaging in learning and it's a great modeling for our students to see their parents are learning and the majority of the parents that engage in this are newcomer parents and it's great to see that they've come to the country and they want to find the tools to be successful themselves and how they can engage and help their students in school and there's lots of research I won't go into it that shows the connections and the nexus between parents learning and engaging in the system and supporting their students so um, if you want more information around this, go to our website and there's more uh, information around there. Uh, improved communication, I won't go through that, but uh, I think Mark was just talking about Facebook, Instagram and all, and all the other areas. And, and so we've uh, really engaged in trying to get information out and we've got many, many, many followers in all different sites sort of um, learning about what's happening in our system. And that's a vast improvement from what we had several years ago. And those who've been following, you've noticed that our website has changed over the last couple of years in terms of being able to provide information to the public as readily as possible. Um, let's skip that. 
Early education. So early ed is, is critically important. We know that every dollar we spend at the early ages is $10 at the top end. Uh, we, we still keep a focus on the early ed, and we've got a great curriculum director around early education. We've got a number of sites, and there are tremendous initiatives that are happening to support um, these learners as they enter into uh, our system. And if you look at the data, you can see students who are engaged in preschool and in these programs, uh, versus students who don't have those opportunities, there is a gap when they start school. And so, you know, we want to uh, continue to build the capacity in these programs so um, all students in Burlington who wish to can be part of, of these programs as well. Technical Center, this is probably the best kept secret in education around here, uh, BTC. Um, people know that we have an aviation program and we have airplanes, we have an FBI plane, we've got all kinds of um, innovative um, practical um, initiatives for students. We get uh, from the private sector people calling our tech center asking for um, students to be employed in aviation and we can't supply them enough. They're like, oh, we need this many. And so I would encourage you to actually check out the uh, tech center. It's, uh, we've won many grants and awards around the initiatives and to promote um, the tech center. There's some amazing things going on there. And in terms of employability, there are so many jobs out there that need the skills that you can, uh, you, you can acquire through these tech centers that students aren't quite aware of. And we're trying to do a better job working with our high school to create our schedule so our students can take more advantage of it. It's open regionally, so we get students from all over the region, but our, our kids in Burlington have uh, direct access um, to it. Um, here's some of the uh, celebrating success. Um, one of the slides up there, I didn't spend that much time on it, but um, as we're moving forward now, when we're really focusing on our academic agenda, um, what the phrase I've been talking about is closing the gap while raising the bar, right? That's the achievement bar. So that means we have a number of vulnerable or uh, usually identified students who are in the gap, they're underperforming, and we have the kids at the top. So we want to employ strategies that we can close that gap, but at the same time, we want to raise the bar for everyone. So those kids that are getting 85, 90, we want them to excel and be enriched, and we want these other kids to kind of catch up and close the gap. So here's an example of um, many of our students who are thriving and are, are, are getting excellence in the different, uh, uh, different spheres. And if you take a look at the, um, the BHS Scholar Bowl state championships there, um, those, that was an all-girls team, and they kicked butt, yeah. right? So some more, some, some more um, identifiable, sort of notable students who've gotten uh, national, we've been recognized nationally and across the state for our student achievement. So no one can say that Burlington students are not um, going above the bar here. Actually, before I, we've had national scholars the last uh, three years and presidential scholars every year in Burlington. And uh, the one year I believe we had, there were uh, six or seven presidential scholars throughout the country, and three of them were from Burlington. How amazing is that? Right? Uh, so English language learners, we have a great English language learner program and we're continuously developing strategies to integrate more. Um, last year we started this app that's able to do translations and start communicating with parents. Everyone has a phone now. So we're trying to hook into that technology to be able to con communicate with our, our parents and our communities at every level to, uh, to find success for them. And these are just some highlights of uh, some of our staff who've had uh, been recognized throughout the course of the year. We've got you know national principals of the year awards to um, um, substitute teacher of the year for the state. So you know our staff are really stepping up and uh, providing great service for our students and also being recognized both at the state level and at the uh, national level as well. Uh, when you talk about innovation, Burlington certainly is innovation. There's a city and lake semester program. And what's really unique about this program that it's kind of, it's kind of grassroots because it started with a couple of community members, a couple of staff. They came and had a proposal. 
We sent them back, we said we couldn't do that. They went out and got grants, they, they developed the program, and now we've got this amazing program that our students engage in learning in the city. And I know that uh, they had an audience with, uh, with the mayor last year, and they were, they were talking about the, their equity data, their equity report, and gave them input, and many of the students got really engaged around um, changing their careers and, and um, all kinds of, I had an opportunity to, uh, to go to their closing at the end of the year to hear um, about their successes, and it was amazing. And one of the questions I asked the students is, you know, what makes you successful here than when you had classes in the classroom, in the building, in the school, because they're not housed in the school. They go around the city and they have a spot downtown as well too. And they talked about the engagement and the learning style was different. So you had students who were, who were poor performers or high achieving. You had high achieving students who now really found their niche and were connected to different avenues of, uh, of career paths that they, they never even considered. So um, we hope to continue that program and to look at other ways of uh, innovating. We've had lots of, um, communication from other jurisdictions who are interested in trying to replicate um, this. So if they come knocking on your door, if you're a business person or you're, you work in a community some, somewhere, please open your doors to these students and give them an opportunity to uh, learn about what you do. Uh, continue on curriculum innovation. This cart, this food cart here, that was um, developed by students. And there's a number of them in the, in the schools. And so now they, 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 they use, use it as lessons and they actually get to actually prepare food on it as well too. And I'm talking elementary kids, not the, even the, the high school kids. So it's lots of good innovative uh, initiatives happening. Um, I talked about, we implemented our achievement gap strategy. So we want to aggressively look at what we can do to address the challenges for our vulnerable students. And to do that, you have to keep an eye on the prize. And so we had to dedicate special staff who were doing research. They were, we had a team go away to Harvard last summer and spent the summer with a number of districts across the country, with instructors there, and they came back and we hired some special staff. They're doing some data analysis and come up with strategies that are gonna help our students in terms of uh, closing the job. So, so we're really excited about that and look forward to uh, progress in this arena. And here's some examples of work that's happened already. I really like this part because I, I see the picture in the corner. Dig into the data. That's one of our um, teachers and uh, instructional, instructional coach. And they had work with a group of teachers around um, formative assessments in terms of using data to change their practice to support students. And they were doing a bit of a celebration. I like that because I really like cake. So uh, I like to show, show up for those opportunities. And um, I thought that was really a fun way for them to celebrate with their students and with their staff in terms of you can make the change if you add the right strategy and you put the effort um, forward, right? I wish I had time to go into detail about all of these, but I know that we're only here for, right? So you can see lots of professional development for our staff in terms of how to, we can't just tell the staff we need to close the gap. We have to give them the resources and the supports to do that, and I thank Burlington for supporting our budgets, that gives us the opportunity to hire the appropriate staff and also the professional development that's needed to uh, support these learners. Okay, sustainable finance, I won't spend too much time on this because you've probably seen a lot of propaganda around this prior to the uh, votes and things. We want to thank Burlington for supporting the re-envisioning of Burlington High School and we'll be embarking on a, on a 21st century learning space, which is going to be amazing. And this is also tagged with BTC, Technical Center. So you can imagine the infusion of the Technology Center and the high school. We're going to have double gyms, drama centers, the arts, the music, everything. It's going to be a beautiful site. It's going to be an engaging place for our students to learn for the next 50, 60 years. Right, so that's gonna be an amazing thing. That's, it's not only gonna be a, a building, but it's actually gonna change instruction because the design that we're working on is, is, is helping um, our teams and departments in how they plan together and work together and also using maker spaces in terms of how we give instruction and supports. And those of you who've actually been to Burlington High School, if you've been to the science labs, anyone been to the science labs, they're um, not appropriate um, for 21st century for sure. One, first of all, um, the spaces are not enough for to fit the right size classrooms and the equipment is not up to date. So we're gonna have a chance to bring our kids, um, give them the resources they need and, and be able to uh, strive forward. Um, we have a capital plan, we have a 10 year capital plan. 
that's working on not just the high school, but all of our schools are in the plan. Um, and um, we're, we're doing that. So if you drive by Main Street, you might have seen Edmonds being worked on all summer, right? So it's not going to be totally done, but by uh, when school starts, it's a major part of it's done. If you ever get a chance actually to go in, go in and take a look at the, uh, the new cafeteria and the new gymnasium that's been, that's been designed there. And there's an area there that used to be called the dungeon. And now it's a beautiful space and there's light coming through and, and the kids are, are loving it. So uh, take the opportunity to, uh, to go and see that if you can. Uh, oh, here's some photo. I forgot we had some photos. So you can see this cafe. This part was just a, a basement, you know, about a year ago. And now look at it. It's beautiful. There's the window on the left, lights coming. The our food services staff are really loving us right now because all that equipment is brand new. New ovens, you know, new cookware, ventilation. And you can see the, uh, the, uh, the, the order spot here is nice and spacious for students to walk by, get their food, and uh, go forward, right? So it's exciting stuff. All right. Um, just once again, just to thank you around the uh, budget. So you know that in the last, um, we moved from a deficit to having surplus in our budgets. And every year we've been able to take that money and reinvest it back in our students and also bring down the tax um, to bring down the tax rate. And I'm hoping that, you know, we're going to be uh, physically restrained enough that we'll be able to continue to do that and reinvest the money that Burlington has uh, supported us um, the last uh, uh, five years. Right? Yep. I still have another, another okay. section, but I'll, I'll just I'll shoot through really quick. Okay. So the last section was equitable uh, climate and culture. Uh, restorative practices. Maybe you might have heard this phrase before restorative practices, RP, sometimes people say, and we're a restorative practices district. So we are on a mission to train and educate all our educators as well as our students in terms of how to use restorative practices. And restorative practice is a strategy and approach to uh, keep students and staff feel included and to repair harm when they're situation and to problem solve and critical, critical think. So our teachers are getting trained. You'll go to some of our schools and some classes start every class now with a restorative circle. And teachers report back that it's really changed the environment of the class and students feel safe and the relationships they have and then you can get deeper into the work and they feel that level of support. So we're ongoing. There was, and we had, um, even over the summer, there was training. We continue that work as well too. You can see this photo here. We're really taking this seriously. We had um, over 400 employees for one day at Bronson High School. We did a lot of training, a lot of work, and we all interacted and uh, went out, went back to our schools the next day to try to implement some of the strategies there. Um, always on the focus in terms of the equity lens, um, one of the things we've uh, tried to highlight in terms of uh, around Black History Month is not just doing the work in that month, that the work continues on. And many of our schools have engaged our staff to come into our schools and work with the students and talk to them about their own experiences and I had an opportunity to do that as well, too. And that's some of the best experiences I have as a superintendent is uh, the little one. But they ask you tough questions, those, those ones sometimes. Um, and we had our second annual Beyond Black History Month. It's a community event. You can see this, the, the, the show of support. Uh, people come out. We have food. We have um, some literature that's shared. We have entertainment. We have students' performances. It's a really fun event. Look for it this year. If you're available, please come. It's free. Come, enjoy, and uh, share with us um, about learning around black history and civil rights um, during that time. Engaging. Facilities, again, we've been highlighted in um, some really good articles around our equity initiatives. And this particular news article was around the um, gender neutral washrooms and the work we were doing um, in the schools. And that was uh, really proud to see how far we've come with that. And of course, we always like oh, teacher appreciation. Well, I'll skip that. There's a bunch of graphics there, what we did on teacher appreciation, but it disappeared on me somehow. Um, so I'll stop there so you can have, we can have some time for some questions if people would like. And um, thank you for listening so well. Thank you. And uh, <laughs> not throwing tomatoes or uh, yeah. anything, anything. There's a lot of people here that have kids that are high school graduates from BHS. We have three, Linda. Carol, yeah. If, if maybe somebody who hasn't spoken tonight, I can, I can talk to you later. Unless you have a question.
Does anybody have any questions? It was okay. great. I'll take it. Y'all, thank you so much for coming, and I uh, really appreciate your, your work and how you've transformed our, our um, biggest school um, system in the, in the state. I was wondering a couple things. Number one, could you please come back and, and provide us an update on uh, the, the racial equity piece alone by itself? It's just that important. I, th I think it is, and I, I don't think there's a lot of folks around the table who probably, probably would disagree. Uh, and, and the other is a, is a question is, is have, you, have you met the racial equity director since she's been in the state? go on to our site for a preview before I come back. We do a report every year called the Equity Data Report. And that report actually looks at uh, race, soci socioeconomic status, and other pieces. And there's lots of information in there that you can learn about um, what we've been doing. Um, so I would love the opportunity to come back and talk about the um, direction we're going with that and the work that we're doing and our struggles and challenges uh, around that as well, too. Okay. Oh, you need we the mic. Get, I guess yeah, we have to share because the other one, the batteries are dead touched on it so this was great and informative for me um, uh, Karen was referencing I have two children that obviously are adults and graduated from BHS one of them was a real challenge for you <laughs> the other one not so much but anyways um, I I just um, I wanted to know if you could just briefly say where you think your biggest challenge is right now. These were all successes and you know goals and you've attained a lot of things, but obviously there are, must be some other things that you feel you either haven't completely accomplished or goals that you didn't identify here that need to be now addressed this coming fiscal year. Uh, good question. The I would say without a doubt, and I'm not saying this off the top of my head because we actually did a survey to students, to parents, and to our staff. One of the biggest challenges we have is social emotional wellness, and that's impacted everyone at so much level. So that means the type of special ed supports we need, social work supports, guidance supports, clinical supports. How do we do that to? And we've got kids who come in with trauma, you know. Um, all kinds of experiences and you can't get to learning within that. So one of the challenges that we have that we haven't been able to get there yet is to create a structure that we have the uh, levels of tiers interventions. You know, we got the universal for everyone and we have the next, next neediest and then the most neediest. And how do we do that in an effective way and still keep people's dignity in terms of being able to recognize they have challenges around that. Um, the other thing I would say is the biggest challenge is, and we're actually moving on to that, is around our school improvement plans. We have school improvement plans and the strategies around um, achievement to, um, to be able to identify the high yield strategies and to be able to have the time to train all our staff and then get the appropriate data to say this is our baseline and then be able to measure it over the course of time. Because then I can say, oh, OK, we did this, we did this, and it worked or didn't work. Let's not spend money on that. Let's not put resources. So that's where, that's where we're at right now. And so um, I feel good about where we're starting. And I, one of the slides I showed you, we have an achievement gap lead and a data system. So that, those people are starting that work. And so we haven't been able to get to that work because we've done the structure and processes pieces. And now we're getting to that work. So looking forward to trying to get to that foundation. And we've got some great staff who are doing those things in their classrooms and doing some, so we want to pull some of those uh, strategies from them and be able to consolidate and have a system approach to it. So, I would say the answer would be no. The answer is always no. I don't think there's enough resources. So the strategy that I take is, how do we do some things differently to accommodate, and at the same time, yeah, look for some more resources if we if we can. But um, I mean, adding more more dollars sometimes is not always the, the you know about quality. So we're trying to balance that, you know, not trying to just go out and say we need more of these. Just trying to think about it and be strategic about it and say, okay, yeah, we do need more of those. Now let's add that and let's uh, do that. But I have to say that our board and the community have been very supportive when we've been asking um, for more resources to say, yeah, we need that. They ask the tough questions: Why do you need it? How do you, you know, what's it going to do? And that's good. So. Um, 
I, I'm certain that we'll be having some uh, ask during our budget cycle around addressing those needs um, coming forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, do we want to take one more question? We are at 9.01. One quick. Thanks. Y'all, thanks very much for the uh, presentation. Um, do you ever um, try to, not, not you personally, but the, the uh, district, try to quantify the value of the high school so that you can put successes and, and positive trend, positive or negative, I guess, but positive trends, hopefully, in some sort of, uh, use Mark's word, economic context, um, uh, so that you, you can, um, I'm not quite sure what the word is, but um, uh, articulately, I guess, uh, show at budget time what the value of the high school and all the work that you're doing is to the, to the community at, at large. It could be graduation rates, it could be crime coming down, it could be all sorts of positive things, or, or you know, what the, what the trends are and the, 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 the bigger social picture. Take this last one. Yeah, I'll try to be. I'll probably be quick with it. Um, good question. Yeah, you know, we have attempted to do that in different ways, and I don't think we've found an elegant solution for a holistic approach. There are certain initiatives and programs that we've been able to to make a direct correlation because one thing that happens in education, um, there's often not a one-to-one -one relationship, right? You think, okay, you add. For instance, I'll give you a good example: restorative practices. We've instituted restorative practices. We reduce our instructional, our suspensions, and l students are more in class than out of school. Can we attribute everything to restorative practice? I would say not, right? There might be other elements that are in there. And we've partnered with uh, UVM and other um, institutions with our research team to try to figure out ways how we can um, you know, uh, do the assessment to put some value on it. But it is challenging. Um, I know when I first came, um, we tried to do that because we were um, because we were really trying to balance the budget and trying to figure out, okay, what's economical? And we did do some of those analysis, but um, I didn't totally trust it all because it's, there are so many other variables that you don't consider. So it's not a direct, but it is challenging. But some programs we can do that, but for the high school overall, um, I know you can do a ratio in terms of how many students and what we pay and, and work out and get a number of it and, and do a formula with the uh, achievement, but it doesn't give you what's in between, right? So it, it is challenging, but um, that would be good if I could have something clear like that and people can say, you're investing this and this is what you're going to get and make those guarantees. That would be, uh, if you get any idea if you're the only way doing that, please let me know because that would be great. Thank, Thank you. you so much. That's great. Thank you. So good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. And next month, we definitely, we clarified the officer's coming. He said he'll come back for a half hour. So bring your questions about traffic and whatever else. Housing. Excuse me? Housing. Housing. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>